Welcome to Voice of the Vatican, our top stories. Living Fully, a conference in Rome celebrates the lives and stories of disabled people, discusses methods of inclusion in faith life, and introduces the study of disability theology. Novena for Peace. Thousands representing various faiths descended upon the Redemptorist Monastery of Clonard in Belfast, Ireland to pray the annual Novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. European Arts Forum. The work of young artists across Europe is brought together to examine the relationship between art, culture, human dignity, and the human condition. Feast Day. We'll take a look at the special way Rome celebrates the feast of the great patrons of the city, Saints Peter and Paul. Suicide bombings. Bishop of Lebanon speaks out against the heinous attacks in Ka that devastated the Christian village. Papal trip. The Holy Father returns from Armenia after delivering an ecumenical message during the 14th international journey of his pontificate. The church in Mongolia. We'll visit the Apostolic Prefecture of Mongolia to learn how Christ has been brought to a country made up primarily of Buddhists. I'm Ashley Narona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican only on Shalom World TV. A three-day event entitled Living Fully 2016, Disability, Culture, and Faith took place in Rome. In order to bring to light the latest advances in methodologies of experts, practitioners, and disabled people from 12 countries who are finding ways to integrate disabled people more fully into the life of the church. People with disabilities, often their bodies are seen as being less than. Um, and uh, in John Paul II's Theology of the Body, he gives us the opportunity to actually see that every single body, no matter what it looks like or how a person thinks, has the capacity to whisper God to us. And so um, the theology of disability and the theology of the body are so united because both say, you have to recognize me as a perfectly created person. Um, and see the value of my presence in the world and how we together uh, can teach and learn about God. And I think that this conference um, sought to unite people from all over the world that are working in this field. The initiative was organized by the Kairos Forum in collaboration with the Pontifical Council for Culture with the hope to spread awareness following the Pope's call for inclusion of disabled people in society and church life. Speakers came from around the world to discuss this theme. If we look at the core mission of any faith community, we are already, or sorry, we should already be including people living with a disability, because that's our core mission, that's the gospel. But what I'm arguing in the paper is that um, inclusion should take on a more deeper and more uh, profound form of belonging. During the Jubilee of the Disabled and the Great Jubilee of the Year 2000, Pope St. John Paul II addressed the disabled present with the words, In your bodies and in your lives, dear brothers and sisters, you express an intense hope of redemption. With that, we remember the consoling words of Luke 21, 28. Look up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Despite the hostilities that simmer in the city of Belfast in Northern Ireland, every year the city unites for a solemn occasion. The annual Novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help at the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer at the Clonard Monastery, under the auspices of the Redemptorist Congregation. The nine days of prayer is a time for Catholics, Protestants, and those of other religious denominations to come together to renew peace and the spirit of collaboration. In fact, the Redemptorists of Clonard Monastery have been instrumental in the peace process in Northern Ireland for decades, with many negotiations, peace talks, and community gatherings taking place within the monastery's sacred walls. It was in the 1850s that the Redemptorists were first invited to come to Ireland. We began in Limerick in 1852, and shortly afterwards we were invited to come to Belfast 
This is uh, in the north of Ireland, where uh, traditionally a lot of um, mills and industry, the linen industry, was, was very uh, big in this area. It was a very Protestant part of Ireland, but they needed workers, so uh, there was a lot of migrant workers came to hear from other parts of, of Ireland, uh, and these were poor people, and the Redemptorists were invited to come to Belfast to accompany these migrants and to be, uh, I suppose, spiritual guides and, and to offer support to, to these poor Catholic people. 2016 marks the 150th Jubilee year of the Redemptorist special mission to make the icon of Our Lady of Perpetual Help known throughout the world. And in Belfast, thousands came from throughout Ireland, England, and Europe to attend the Novena, bringing petitions, sorrows, and prayers before the miraculous icon of Our Lady. In the picture, you see the pain, of course, the suffering, the image of the, the child having a dream of foreseeing what's going to happen. And it's also Our Lady been aware of the pain of people and bringing their pain. And uh, in the icon, the, the fingers of Our Lady are rather elongated, pointing to the child but her eyes are looking at you. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's taken on, I suppose, the pain of people. Is the folk, and that's what you get here when you hear the petitions, people coming with their needs. The papal nuncio to Ireland, Archbishop Charles Brown was the main celebrant of the Mass for Youth. Concelebrated by Redemptorist priests, along with His Excellency Noel Trainer, the Bishop of Down and Connor. Well, Clonard, of course, the Clonard Monastery has a very important place in the history of Northern Ireland and the history of of the city of Belfast in a very special way. Much of the progress that resulted in the cessation of the troubles took place in this monastery. So it's a place of reconciliation, a place of dialogue, a place of reaching across borders and boundaries and walls to create community and to overcome difficulties and hostility. So that's really what the, the mission of the Redemptorist priest here in Clonard has been for all of these years. So when they invited me to come and celebrate the Mass for the Novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, or our Mother of Perpetual Help, I was really delighted to say yes. So I was happy to be here. And for this last 20 odd years, we have been in, enjoying, I use in inverted commas, uh, a, a type of peace in, in Northern Ireland where there is not so much paramilitary um, activity. Uh, and we have all parties nearly involved in the new assembly and we're working. It takes a long time to break down division, but the first big step has been taken. But as you can see 20 years later, we still have a peace wall and it has got higher and we still need to continue this work of reconciliation, which means finding gaps in that wall where we can bring people together to speak and to look each other in the eye. The nearby Adoration Convent participated in the Novena Prayers and Sister Martina Prudy, a former correspondent of the BBC, and now a sister of the Adoration Convent, spoke to Shalom World TV about the Novena. The Lord has so many titles. Divine Mercy is one of them, and uh, Mercy and Compassion is poured out from Clonard. And Jesus is here 24 hours a day, seven days a week, on his mercy seat, waiting to be gracious. Sister Elaine Kelly, a former lawyer, also shared her experience. I only first went to Clonard uh, maybe about you know, 96, I was in my early 20s at the time. But I found it a, a, piece, a, a place of peace and great joy and acceptance. Because at that time I wasn't walking with the Lord, I wasn't really going to Mass. But Clonard was part of my return and my faith. The majority of the pilgrims attending the Novena were youth, between 20 and 35. You express your faith um, by coming to church, by being part of a liturgy even though what is going on with you is quite personal, a relationship between yourself and God. Um, but when you can express that with others, um, it can only strengthen your faith. And something like the Novena here, when you come and you listen to the prayers of people, the petitions, the thanksgivings um, that are, are shared here uh, during this time, um, people can identify with that. We pray through the intercession of Our Lady of Perpetual Help, that through the active participation of the Redemptress with the blessings of the Nunciature and the local bishop and diocesan curia, the faith of Ireland will be invigorated. European artists, art critics, scholars, and decision makers gathered in Brussels this week for a forum titled Art and Culture, Learning How to See Again. 
This is the second annual European Arts Forum from the World Youth Alliance, and it simultaneously exhibited the diverse work of young artists from across Europe, while examining the relationship between art, culture, human dignity, and human rights. Artwork selected for exhibition ranged from sculpture to painting to jewelry making to coffee bean mosaics. The World Youth Alliance aims for the event to encourage art as an expression of human dignity and to highlight the crucial role it plays in the understanding of human life. That is, since art has a transformative power which encourages the individual to move beyond oneself, to connect with a greater community, and to contribute to society and culture. While the beauty of art elevates our hearts, minds, and souls, Isaiah 52, 7 reminds us that the most beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. On the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, Pope Francis presided at Mass in St. Peter's Basilica to mark the feast of two of the patron saints of the city of Rome. The solemn Mass was broadcast live on Shalom World TV. This year, a Lutheran choir from Germany and an Anglican choir from Oxford joined with the Sistine Chapel Choir to animate the Mass and honor the saints, called the Pillars of the Church in Rome. During the Mass, the Pope also blessed the Pallia, the stoles which will be presented to the 25 new Metropolitan Archbishops who've been appointed over the past year. A pallium is woven of white lamb's wool that was blessed on the Feast of St. Agnes and it rests on the bishop's shoulders over the chasuble. A theory connects its origins with the figure of Christ as the good shepherd, carrying the lamb on his shoulders. The pallium is decorated with six black crosses, and only the Pope, Metropolitan Archbishops, and the Latin Rite Patriarch of Jerusalem wear them, signifying their union with the Apostolic See. After Mass, the Holy Father prayed the Angelus Prayer with the faithful in St. Peter's Square, and in his address, asked for prayer for the victims of the Istanbul airport bombing, their relatives, and for the Turkish people. He prayed that the Lord convert the hearts of the violent to support steps on the path of peace. And thousands of miles away in the very city where St. Peter was bishop before coming to Rome, and where for the first time the disciples of Jesus were called Christians, Catholics and Orthodox together celebrated the Feast of St. Peter and Paul. And in Takya, Turkey, formerly known as Antioch, at the cave church of Peter on Mount Silpius, Catholics and Orthodox worshipped together in a sign of unity. In his homily for the feast, Pope Francis said that prayer is the answer for all and serves as, quote, a way out for a community which risks closing in on itself out of persecution and fear. Just as prayer was a way out for Peter, who at the very beginning of his mission was cast into prison, we pray for the intercession of the great saints Peter and Paul for the strength to always bear witness to God before the world. Two series of suicide bombings devastated the Lebanese village of Ka this week, killing five and injuring at least 28. In the morning, four suicide bombers blew themselves up, killing five people and wounding another 15. In the evening, as family members gathered outside a church to mourn the victims, two men on a motorcycle threw a grenade at the group before detonating suicide vests, wounding another 13 people. The village is inhabited mostly by Christians belonging to the Greek Melkite Church. About 30,000 Syrian refugees also live around the village. Archbishop Elias Rahal, the head of the Greek Melkite Archdiocese in Baalbek, also a native of Ka, called upon the Lebanese state to take responsibility after this horrific act. Patriarch Gregory III, primate of the Greek Melkite Church, said he was appalled by the attack and paid personal tribute to the victims. Maronite Patriarch Rai, currently on a pastoral visit in the United States, said he hoped that also this, quote, crime without a name pushes the Lebanese to regain national unity and defend it from terrorist plans. Pope John Paul II said that peace is not only the absence of war, but like a cathedral, peace must be constructed patiently and with unshakable faith. We pray for that patience and faith so that peace will soon rule that land. 
The Pope's three-day visit to the Orthodox nation of Armenia carried a message of peace and reconciliation, and even called for unity with Armenia's Oriental Orthodox Church. The visit included an historic stop at the nation's closed western border with Turkey and a joint declaration with the Apostolic Church leader. Quella tragedia, quel genocidio, inaugurò purtroppo il triste elenco delle immani catastrofi del secolo scorso, rese possibili da aberranti motivazioni razziali, ideologiche o religiose che ottenebrano la mente dei carnefici fino al punto di prefigere l'intento di annientare interi popoli. Condividiamo con grande gioia i tanti passi di un cammino comune già molto avanzato e guardiamo davvero con fiducia al giorno in cui, con l'aiuto di Dio, saremo uniti presso l'altare del sacrificio di Cristo nella pienezza della comunione eucaristica. Chiedo di benedirmi, di benedire me e la Chiesa Cattolica, di benedire questa nostra corsa verso la piena unità. Coming up next, we'll go up close with the Napa Institute, a meeting of Catholic leaders which aims to equip leaders to defend and advance the Catholic faith in the next America, that is, today's emerging secular society. And as the United States Independence Day approaches, we'll take a look at a prayer app created especially for soldiers by military chaplains. Welcome to the free Shalom World TV app for iPhones, iPads, and Android phones. Now it's easier than ever to access great Catholic television on the go. The main screen shows you upcoming specials, allows you to access the live stream broadcast, get a full television schedule, don't want to miss your favorite show? Set up a reminder, and view featured shows or get to exactly what you want with one click of the menu. Can't watch? Why not listen to the live stream? Have a prayer request? Send it easily. Want Shalom World TV added to your local cable or satellite provider's lineup? Make the request. Or sign up for updates from Shalom World TV. Shalom World is available in the App Store or on Google Play. Just search for Shalom World and click Get or Install. It's as easy as that. Be sure to allow for notifications so you can get updates on all the newest TV program offerings. Shalom World TV. This is God's own channel, closer than ever before. More headline news. As Voice of the Vatican continues to share the universal church with you, we now take you to a far-off land, one that is not ordinarily associated with Christianity, 
but most often with Huns, Buddhism, and Genghis Khan. Mongolia, a land sandwiched between China and Russia, it is one of the oldest countries in the world. Home to two extreme climatic conditions, Mongolia brought the world the Great Mongol Empire and the Silk Road, which connected the Orient and the Occident. Today, the Mongolian population is approximately 53% Buddhist, and 38% claim no religion at all. In the 13th century, Genghis Khan proved a mighty ruler and patron of art, and the founder of the fourth largest empire in the world, which spread its wings from China to Europe. Shalom World TV was the first Christian television network that crossed continents and six different time zones to the land of the blue sky to meet with one of the youngest Catholic communities in the world. Built on the unconditional dedication of a bishop and his brother priests and their obedience to the See of Rome. It was under the reign of Pope St. John Paul II in 1992 that diplomatic relations were established between the Vatican and Mongolia. His Excellency Bishop Wenislao Padilla is the Apostolic Prefect of Mongolia. And when he arrived in that country, there was no Catholic presence there at all. Now, sitting in the house of the prefecture in the Mongolian capital, the bishop spoke to Shalom World TV about the current state of the Catholic Church in Mongolia. To start uh, an endeavor is always uh, difficult, no? Any kind of endeavor, if you start, then there are always uh, problems and difficulties. First, we have to adjust to uh, the country, the culture of the, the, the people, no? We have to adjust for especially in the, uh, the language. The language is very difficult language, no? And then uh, there is a very strong uh, presence of uh, Buddhist, predominantly Buddhist country is uh, uh, Mongolia. And then we have to contend with also the weather conditions. The uh, Mongolian weather, uh, especially the winter, is very harsh, it's severe. When it goes negative 45, negative 50, negative 35, uh, this is uh, very, un very unbearable for uh, tropical uh, climate uh, people. So these are things that we have to contend with. So we try to uh, keep on with the activities that we have. We are sent here as missionaries to proclaim the good news of salvation to all corners of the world, uh, and especially those in places where uh, the gospel is not yet pronounced or proclaimed, or where the gospel ceased to uh, be existing. No? And that for Mongolia, it's a very new uh, thing for them. Uh, so we have to just to work hard and uh, try to proclaim to the people here that they are also loved by a merciful, a loving, and compassionate God. From the zero population of Catholics, now we have around 1,300 uh, baptized Mongolian brothers and sisters. Before, we didn't have any uh, local uh, vocation, but uh, thanks to uh, the Lord that uh, there are three seminarians now who, who are in Korea for their seminary training because we don't have any formation here. It's too early a church. And so uh, the first one who has finished almost eight years of seminary training in Daijun Diocese, um, fully covered by the arts di the diocese of Daijun, uh, will be ordained this year in August 28. So that's why we are uh, getting ready for uh, this ordination, first time ever in Mongolia. Pray for His Excellency and his brother priests and catechists as they strive to bring Christ to the country of Mongolia and for the gift of the ordination of the first Mongolian priest. Nestled in the beautiful Napa Valley, California, the Napa Institute is preparing to meet from July 6th through 10th with a mission to equip Catholic leaders to defend and advance the Catholic faith 
in the next America, today's emerging secular society that sadly seeks to silence our faith. The creation of the Institute was inspired by an article written by Archbishop Shep Hugh of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, about the growing dangers of secularization in America. In response, the Napa Institute was born to help Catholic leaders face the challenge posed in the next America in order to continue the work of the apostles and their successors, the bishops, heeding Christ's call for ongoing evangelization. I sat down with the executive director of the Napa Institute to find out more. As lay people especially, we need to be out there doing the work. We can't just rely on the church. The church is where we go forth from to bring the, the faith to the rest of the world. We, we come back to the church for the, the renewal we need, but then we must go out and share that good news with everyone else. And our leaders, especially those in positions of power or influence, they need to be equipped to defend the Catholic teaching, not just this is what the church tells me. Mm -hmm. But they need to know why. Because everything the church believes, they believe for very good reason. So they need to know the philosophy, they need to know the theology behind these decisions, whether it be the euthanasia issue, or life issues, or family issues, whatever it is, they don't need to just say, I believe this because the Catholic Church believes this. Exactly. They need to be there and be able to say, I believe this, and here is, even if you're not Catholic, here is some philosophy behind why this makes sense. By leading participants to a deeper understanding of the truth, the Napa Institute emboldens Catholics to live and defend their faith with a peaceful confidence that is born out of solid formation, fellowship, and spiritual enrichment. The conference features cardinals, bishops, renowned priests and religious, and Catholic intellectuals who present thoughtful lessons on timely topics. At that conference, we, we, have, we hope to do three things. We hope to give intense spiritual formation. We want to give formation on three topics at that conference that we feel are going to be the biggest issues faced by Catholics in the next year. We also want to give them a mini retreat, a spiritual renewal, an uplifting. But probably the third and one of the most important aspects is camaraderie. We want to bring the right Catholics into the room so that they can receive this amazing formation, you know, grow in their faith together, but then meet each other so then in turn they can go out and change the world together. So that was the, that was the the start of it, the one conference, and since then we've grown to do conferences and symposiums all over the country, internationally here in Europe, pilgrimages to different locations as well. Um, really, we try to be a resource for a Catholic leader, lay or ordained, to, to come and, and receive what they need to be more effective leaders in the culture. More of this in-depth interview on the Napa Institute and its work empowering Catholic leaders, go to www.shalomworldtv.org slash VOV. When the armed services are employed in battlegrounds across the globe, a little book over the years has provided much consolation. It's called the Mingi Prayer Book and was developed by military chaplains as the result of experiences of prayer, conversation, and sacraments that chaplains have shared with their personnel. Its variety of prayers are meant to provide reflections pertinent to various moments throughout a soldier's life, whether prayed at home, in a garrison chapel, or overseas. But problems arose from a logistical perspective, as soldiers tended to lose the prayer books as they traveled, or often forgot to take them out of their pockets before taking their clothes to the laundry. So, through the gift of technology, the Mingi app was born. Via the app, soldiers can meditate on multi-denominational prayers and reflections, as well as into religious prayers, which cater to personnel, their families, and their colleagues with whom they serve overseas. It includes a favorite prayer of Pope Francis to Our Lady on Tyre of Knots, and also the Serenity Prayer, prayer in times of grief, and a prayer before setting out on a journey. The app also has a section called Windows of Faith, which allows the mind to be elevated by beautiful stained glass images. One image is a soldier wearing a G-Shock watch found at Hersey Memorial Chapel in the Renmore Barracks in Ireland. The app also includes a direct link to get in touch with a chaplain with a prayer request. You too can join in prayer for military personnel and download the app at www.militarychaplaincy.ie. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on Facebook on our Voice of the Vatican page. 
Keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions, stories, and news to us at vov at shalomworld.org. I'm Ashley Norona, and on behalf of the entire crew at Voice of the Vatican, I wish you a blessed week and feast of St. Thomas the Apostle. Saying ciao for now from the Eternal City, I'll see you next week on Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV, bringing Rome to your home. <laughs>